Okay, so now let's try to understand the Schrodinger equation for a free particle in one dimension. So here's what we mean by a free particle. It's, it's allowed to be anywhere on this, on the infinite line. Let's say it's its wave function, which describes its amplitude as a function of x, evolves as psi of x, but also there's a time component. So at time t, the amplitude at x is psi of x t. Now, we are trying to understand how psi of x t evolves with, with time. And to do this, we want to write out the Schrodinger equation. And Schrodinger's equation for, for this free particle says i h bar d by dt of psi x comma t is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m d2 by dx squared of psi of x comma t. Okay, so let's try to understand what this is saying. So first of all, we should understand that from the general form of the Hamiltonian, we should understand that from the general form of Schrodinger's equation, this here must be the Hamiltonian. So this is the observable that corresponds to energy. It's minus h power squared over 2m d squared by dx squared. Okay, bit puzzling, but we'll see, we'll try to make sense of this as time goes along. The other thing to see is that, you know, if we step away a little bit and don't worry about all the constants involved, then what Schrodinger's equation for this free particle is saying is d psi of x t by d t is proportional to d squared psi x t over d x squared. Okay, so the time derivative is proportional to the second derivative with respect to x. Where is this coming from? So let's first try to understand this naively, and then we'll try to understand the specific form of the Hamiltonian. So here's the, here's the particle, there's psi of x at time t. And now, let's try to think about what the particle is, is doing. How does this wave function evolve? So, intuitively, what we want is that this the evolution of this wave function should be local. So in other words, the particle, you know, every part of space is sitting there minding its own business. Well, except, you know, what happens here depends in, the, in, in a small period of time, depends only upon a small neighborhood around it. So here's what you might imagine the process is. So X sort of looks around at its neighborhood and looks at X plus delta x and at x minus delta x. And it looks at what's the value of psi of x plus delta x. So let me, let me drop, the, drop the t for now. So it looks at psi of x plus delta x. And it also looks at psi of x minus delta x. And it looks at the average of these two. And it compares itself to the average. And it says, well, the change in psi of x is going to be proportional to how different psi of x is from the average of its neighbors. So the change is going to be proportional to the difference between the average of the neighbors and psi of x itself. Okay? So the, you, you could imagine that intuitively this is sort of a reasonable thing for way for the wave function to, to evolve. And now let's see what this gives rise to. You could write this as everything over 2, and then you'd get this minus 2 times psi of x. So we'll just write this as psi of x plus delta x minus psi of x, and then minus psi of x minus psi of x minus delta x whole thing over 2. By taking this whole thing over 2, there was 2 times psi of x, and I put one of them here and one of them here. Okay, but now, you know, this is like psi prime at x. You know, the derivative 
at, at x. And this is like psi prime at x minus delta x. And so if you're looking at the difference between the derivative at x and the derivative at x minus delta x, this is proportional to the second derivative at x. Right? It's proportional to d2 psi of x by dx squared. And this is where the second derivative is coming from, intuitively. So that's one way to think about it. Here's another way to think about, about Schrodinger's equation. So we said that h was minus h bar squared over 2m d squared by dx squared. So where is this coming from? So remember, this is the energy of the particle. But it's a free particle. So there's no potential energy. The only kind of energy it has is kinetic energy. So classically, what's kinetic energy? We can write it as a half mv squared in terms of the velocity. But we don't like to write things in terms of velocity in quantum mechanics, because to measure the velocity of a particle, you you want to know its, part, its position at time t and then its position at time t plus delta t. And you want to know how much it moved. But remember, we don't want to think about measuring the particle twice, because we don't really think of the particle as having a trajectory. So instead, we want to think of it as in terms of the momentum of the particle. And if p is the momentum of the particle, the energy is p squared over 2m. Right? And so, correspondingly, in quantum mechanics, we have what's called the momentum operator, p hat. And the momentum op operator is just minus i h bar d by dx. And so, the Hamiltonian for a free particle is just the momentum operator p hat squared over 2m, which is just, you know, you, you take p hat and you square it, minus 1 disappears, i squared is minus 1, and then you'd get h bar squared over 2m d squared by dx squared. Okay, so that's, that's how you would get the, the momentum, op the, the Hamiltonian out of the momentum operator. So now, Let's try to understand this momentum operator a little more carefully. So, so remember, we talked about how we might discretize space, you know, discretize the line. So we are looking at, you know, we allow the particle to be at zero, delta, minus delta, etc., up to k delta or minus k delta, right? And now, Let's look at what the discrete analog of this operator would be, i d by dx. What would i d by dx correspond to? Well, it would correspond to if you have psi at x, and then you look at psi at x plus delta x. Oh, sorry, you want to know what's the derivative at x? Well, let's make a symmetric version of, of this uh, derivative operator. So we look at psi of x plus delta x, and we subtract off psi of x minus delta x, right? Divided by delta x, but we just, you know, that's some constant. So we want to say that d psi by dx is sort of proportional to psi of x plus delta x minus psi of x minus delta x. So how do we write this as a, as a matrix? How do you write the operator corresponding to this? OK, so the operator corresponding to this would be like this. You see, so, so the psi is just given by a vector, right? Where, where you, have, you have psi of minus k delta down to psi of k delta. And here you have psi of x. And, and so what should, what should this operator look like? Well. In order to get this behavior, the operator should look like that. One's on off diagonal, zeros everywhere else, minus one's on the below the diagonal, and zeros everywhere else. So now if you, if you look at the exit entry, 
when you multiply, you'd be multiplying by the x row. And psi sub x gets multiplied by 0. Psi of x plus delta x gets multiplied by 1. Psi of x minus delta x gets multiplied by minus 1. So you get psi of x plus delta x minus psi of x minus delta x. So this is what we wanted. But now, this operator is not Hermitian, right? Because when you take the transpose, you don't get back what you, what you started with when you take the conjugate transpose, because this is, of course, real. But now, what if you multiply by i? So all these become i, all these become minus i. OK, so this is like i d by dx. And now what do you get? Well, when you take the, the conjugate transpose of this, you transpose, so minus i's come here and i's down there. But then when you take the conjugate, i goes to minus i. And so this is really a Hermitian operator. OK, so that's it. That's, you know, that's what Schrodinger's equation looks like for a free particle um, in one dimension. And now, in the next video, we'll see how to solve Schrodinger's equation.